video, we're going to be discussing decision making and business intelligence. In particular, we're going to be focusing on information systems that support decision making and help us gather data to make those decisions. But before we get into that, make sure you've read chapter eight in your textbook on decision making and business intelligence. There's also some practice my lab questions you could try after viewing this video, which I highly recommend for studying for quizzes and the final exam. With that out of the way, let's start by discussing decision making. So what is decision making? Well, in terms of business, it's choosing from a range of alternatives. And this is the essence of management. Recall from our very first lecture that for a business to be successful, you need to make more good and correct decisions than bad or incorrect ones. So that sounds easy enough, but in the real world, good decision making is hard. The first issue is that the concept of rationality is hard to define. And what is meant by this is that in real life, it's hard to have a complete and correct understanding of a whole situation or problem. We make decisions based on our understanding of a problem and the environment it's occurring in, but our understanding may be incomplete or incorrect. So how do we determine if that a decision was rational? Well, it's hard to define, and what would count as rational could be different for each person. Is making a decision with limited information rational, even if the outcome is eventually good? What about a decision made with full information, but with a bad outcome? Is that rational or irrational? And that brings us to our next point. Sometimes a good outcome can come from an irrational decision, or a bad outcome can result from a good process. For example, let's say you did something that most people would consider irrational, like investing your whole life savings into Bitcoin. Well, if you did this in 2019 and sold early on in late 2021, for example, you would have had a very good outcome and made a lot of money. The danger of this is that it might give you the false idea that this was a good decision. If you tried repeating it, for example, reinvesting your earnings back into Bitcoin again in November 2021, it would have had a very negative outcome after Bitcoin crashed back down again. You would have lost money. It's the process here that's important and not the outcome. Investing everything in Bitcoin is more gambling than investing, so the process was bad, even if the outcome was good in some cases. So the opposite can also be true. You can make perfect decisions with complete information at the time, but still have a bad outcome. For example, you could have started a new movie theater chain at the end of 2019 and done all your due diligence and made the best decisions possible, but it wouldn't have helped you once the COVID-19 pandemic hit. This does not mean that decision was irrational or poor at the time. It's possible to commit no mistakes at all and still lose. It's not a weakness or a poor decision making. That's just life. The last issue is that humans have limits on our cognitive abilities. We can only take in so much information and consider so many possibilities. This becomes especially true when decisions have to be made rapidly based on a large amount of data. This problem has given rise to the idea of using computers and computerized information systems in the decision-making process. And this is not a new idea by any stretch of the imagination. It dates back to at least the 1950s with computerized systems like SAGE, the Semi-Automatic Ground Environment Air Defense System. SAGE was a computerized air defense system created by the United States to respond to possible airborne threats during the Cold War. It was able to quickly pull together data from multiple radar sites and process it into a single, unified image of the airspace over a wide area, such as the whole of the United States. It was a very early example of computerized information systems to support decision making, and it's still the largest computer ever built in terms of physical size, taking up 20,000 square feet. Interestingly, Sage is also where the trope of important military man sitting around a big table in a meeting comes from, in most movies and TV shows. In fact, the movie Dr. Strangelove even used decommissioned displays from Sage as part of the props in the movie. While Sage and management information systems of the time were surely impressive, especially in size, simply throwing a computer at the problem does not necessarily improve decision making. And this was famously described by Russell Ackoff in the 1960s. In the 1960s was when we actually started seeing some of these information systems starting to become prevalent in business. And in his work, he described MIS as management misinformation systems. His concern was that the designers of MIS make false assumptions about decision making that lead to such systems not leading to good solutions. The first of these false assumptions 
was that managers will make better decisions if they get the data they need. This assumption seems to make sense. More data means we can produce better information, and better information means better decisions. However, Ackoff argues that at some point adding more data and information, even if perfect and correct, will stop aiding in decision making. Also, there's still uncertainty and complexity even when perfect information is available. Again, take that example I gave earlier of starting a movie theater chain right before the pandemic. Even with perfect information about the business, the industry, and the local environment, we wouldn't have been able to predict the pandemic would occur and could impact our business so significantly. The next assumption is that poor decisions are made because we lack information. Well, it can definitely be true that having too little information can be a big problem. Having too much can also be just as damaging. We call this information overload. Recall from our earlier lecture about information that a quality of good information is relevance to the subject or decision at hand. If our MIS spits out tons of information, but it's not relevant to the subject or decision we're trying to make, it could actually hurt our decision-making process as it's distracting us from more important data. The last assumption is that managers know what data or information they need to make a decision. In general, this might be true, or at least managers will have some idea of the information they need to make a decision. Ackoff argues, however, that this assumption is incorrect, that in many cases managers request too much information, including information that may not be relevant to the decision at hand, believing that more information is always better. However, this approach leads to information overload and waste time as now the manager has to sort through what information is actually relevant. It can lead to something called decision paralysis. Decision paralysis occurs when we have to select from many options that are difficult to compare. This can lead to wasting time overanalyzing or overthinking a situation, when all that's really required is a good enough decision rather than a perfect one. In many cases, you'll get a better outcome choosing between two or three alternatives rather than ten or a hundred. A common example with students is picking courses and planning your timetable. You might look at your program's requirements, past student feedback of the instructor, times of day the course is offered, the textbook used, past course outlines, course has lab or tutorial sections, what others think of the course on social media, the instructor's website, and so on. I've even seen services that students pay money for to help them select courses. At the end of this extensive process, you end up with a course that's perfect on paper, but something you might not actually be interested in at all, when all you really needed to know is if the course fulfills your program requirements and if it's relevant to what you want to get out of university. It only needs to be good enough for you to succeed. You don't need the absolute perfect timetable. Time spent making this perfect timetable is time that could have been spent working on assignments, studying, doing extracurriculars, or just simply enjoying life, all of which might have had better long-term outcomes. Knowing how much information is enough and how much time to spend on making a decision are critical skills to have as a manager or a business owner. Let's move on now to the problems with data itself, rather than having too little or too much of it. As we discussed in a previous lecture on Chapter 2, for information to be good, it must be accurate, timely, relevant, just barely sufficient, and worth its cost. If any of these aren't true, it will impact our decision-making mobility. Just barely sufficient would be having the right amount of information to prevent information overload, as we just discussed. What we'll be focusing on now are problems that impact the accuracy of information. And a big factor in this is how clean and accurate our data is that we use to create information that we in turn use to make decisions with. So recall that in a business we want to track everything. Tracking everything gives us the data that we can process to turn into information, and we need information to make decisions. However, when tracking everything, a problem we quickly run into is that raw data has a lot of issues that make it unsuitable for any kind of sophisticated reporting or processing, such as data mining, which we'll be getting into later. The first common issue is dirty data. This is data that includes inaccurate or incorrect values. A great example of this might be if you have a website that collects birth dates from potential customers. For example, Steam, a video game digital distribution service, asks for birth dates to check if a customer is an adult before purchasing some video games that might be considered violent, for example. However, if Steam were to use these birth dates for anything important, they would have a big problem. 
Most customers, when they get to a page like this, they want to get to the page right away. They don't want to put in a real birth date. Instead, they change the year to, for example, 1900. This results in very inaccurate or dirty data in terms of birth dates if Steam were storing this. You'd have real birth dates mixed in with fake ones, mostly those being January 1st, 1900. Dirty data can also include things like nonsensical data. For example, having the letter F for age, or a phone number with all nines. The next issue is missing values, and this is rather self-explanatory. Missing values would be incomplete or absent values. For example, let's say you're conducting a survey of potential customers and collecting home addresses to help determine the location to open up your next store. You could run into problems in things like house numbers, street addresses, city names, provinces, countries, or postal codes being missing in any part of these entries. Something like this could easily occur if this is a paper-based survey where the potential customer could write anything they want, anywhere they want on the form. And you'd be stuck trying to figure out if you should just drop that data from the survey altogether, or if you should try to do your best to sort of locate the customer based on the information they did provide. So next is inconsistent data. And to go back to our potential customer address example, you may have collected addresses, let's say, 10 years ago. Maybe this is a long-term survey. But people move over time, so that data is no longer necessarily correct. This is especially true if you're collecting data over large periods of time. Imagine if this was a long-term survey being done over 10 years. You'd have a mix of outdated addresses mixed in with new correct addresses, and it'd be very hard to distinguish between the two. Data not being integrated correctly is another issue, and this is a common problem if you're dealing with data from different sources. For example, our system might have dates in day-month-year format. Well, another system might be using month-day-year format. If we were to merge these two sources together, you could end up with dates that are ambiguous. Take, for example, this date that I'm showing right now on the screen in blue. Is it September 4th or is it April 9th? Without knowing the correct format, it's impossible to tell. The last issue is data granularity. This describes the degree of summarization or detail in your data. Data with a fine granularity is data that's expressed in precise detail, while data with coarse granularity is data that's highly summarized. This might be a bit confusing, so let's take a look at an example. Here have a list of grades that students scored on an assignment out of 100. This would be an example of fine data, as it's not being processed or summarized in any way. The average of these grades would be an example of coarse data, as it's highly summarized. So why is this a problem? Well, too fine data could be useless or lead to information overload. Too coarse data, on the other hand, would be useless in some cases, as it's not the metric we need. If you want to know how many students failed the assignment, for example, only having the overall average would not be of much help. In general, it's always better to have too fine data than too coarse, as you can always summarize or throw away data you don't need. So how are we going to deal with all of these data problems, and how are we going to collect this data? Well, there's a few types of information systems designed to aid in these tasks. The first of which is Online Transaction Processing Systems, or OLTP for short. These collect and process data about online transactions for an organization. This can be done in real time as the transactions occur, or in batch after a set time period or once enough transactions have occurred. These OLTP systems form the backbone of all computerized systems in an organization and cross both departmental and organizational boundaries. This means that they're often cross-functional or inter-organizational in nature. Now, the words online and transaction can be a bit misleading here. By transaction, we don't necessarily just mean customers purchasing a product, but any kind of database transaction, including adding records, deleting records, or altering records in a database. Similarly, by online, we don't just mean transactions that occur on a website. They can also be things like in-store purchases, if the inventory or purchasing system is tied to a central database, like an inventory management system. The goal of OLTP systems is to support decision-making by collecting raw data about all transactions in an organization and processing these transactions in an efficient and effective manner. In short, OLTP is where our data comes from. One thing that I mentioned that I'd like to focus a bit more on here is real-time and batch processing. 
Real-time processing is when transactions are entered and processed immediately upon entry. This is ideal for when you always need your data to be up to date, but it comes at the cost of complexity, which often means a more expensive information system, both in terms of development costs, maintenance, and hardware costs. Some examples of when this is a good fit are airline reservation systems and banking. In reservation systems, you need an always up-to-date view of what seats have been booked, and what is open or you could easily get into some pretty severe conflicts where you have two customers showing up trying to use the same seat. Similarly, in banking, it's critical that account balances are always up-to-date, or you could have cases where clients spend money that they don't actually have, or they're unable to spend money that they do have that's just been deposited. Batch processing systems, on the other hand, wait until they have a certain number of transactions or a certain amount of time has passed before processing the transaction and updating the information. The advantage of these types of systems is that they cost less and they're easier to build, but this comes at the price of not having live information. These types of systems tend to be ideal when you don't necessarily need the transactions processed live, so long as they're processed eventually. For example, a gas station might accumulate all the transactions that occurred over the course of a day and wait until the end of the day to transmit them to a central office for processing. So to apply this idea a bit, let's look at two cases. The first case is a movie theater that sells tickets online via their website, through automated kiosks, and in person at the counter. The second case is an automated parking meter for a single parking spot. Someone drives up, parks in the space, and then pays at the parking meter using a credit card or cash. Looking at these two cases, what kind of system would be best, real-time or batch? I'll put a timer up and give us a few seconds to think about it. Pause the video if you feel you need to. And we're back. In the first case, it's critical to have an always up-to-date view of what seats are booked and what are available. Because of this, a real-time system must be used. In the second case, either type of processing system could be used and the system would still function correctly. However, using a batch processing system makes sense as it would be less complex and costly. As there's only one parking space involved for each meter, in this case, we don't have to keep track of if the space is full or not. If it is full, there's going to be a car parked in it, preventing anyone from using the space. If it's empty, there's going to be no car there. So we can safely store transactions and process them later. This does, however, open us up to the risk of someone using a cancelled or a maxed out credit card. But the risk of that cost is likely less than the cost of developing a more complex real-time processing system. While data may be collected in online transaction processing systems, it may not be useful for decision making. It could have the many problems we discussed with data, and viewing the massive amount of transactions on their own could easily lead to information overload and make it impossible to find relevant data. Also, as we've discussed before, data on its own isn't useful. It needs to be processed into information to have meaning and aid in decision making. This is where Online Analytical Processing, or OLAP, systems come in. OLAP systems focus on making the data we collected from OLTP systems useful for decision making. They do this by summarizing the data using simple arithmetic and statistical operations on groups of data. In terms of granularity, we could say that OLTP systems provide fine data, while OLAP systems turn that fine data into coarse data by summarizing it. We call OLAP systems online as they allow us to manipulate, summarize, and group and ungroup data live in real time based on current data provided by OLTP systems. Reports created by OLAP systems have measures, also called facts, and dimensions. Measures are fine data items to be summed, averaged, or otherwise processed. Examples would include things like total sales, average sales, and average costs. 
Dimensions are the characteristics of measures. They can be used to group or drill down into a measure. Examples include things like purchase date, customer type, customer location, and sales. Let's now take a quick look at such a report. Here we have a screenshot of an OLAP report from your textbook. This report is an Excel workbook that contains a pivot table generated by an SQL server analysis service. It displays data for a fictional food mart business, which has many different stores, locations, and store types. What's special about this report, and makes it so much more than just a spreadsheet, is that it's connected live to a database backend, and all the data is updated live as it changes for the business. It's also interactive and allows the users to group data by different dimensions to really drill down into the data to find information they need. In effect, Excel is just being used here as the graphical interface for the database backend. In this report, the measure is the store's net sales. And all the numbers displayed here are net sales for different types of stores and products. The dimensions are product family and store type. We can see that the dimensions group or subdivide the measures. In this case, net sales are divided and grouped by product family in the rows and by store type in the columns. A measure with an associated dimension taken as a whole, as we see here, is called an OLAP cube, or sometimes simply just a cube. They're called cubes because there can be more than two dimensions. And just like a cube, it could be three dimensional, with accesses extending out in each direction, like on the z axis, the x axis, and the y axis. Shown here is the same report with a third dimension added, store location, and this allows us to drill down into the data even further. These reports can be extremely powerful and help prevent information overload by allowing each manager to drill down into only the information that's relevant to them. Unfortunately, creating and using these types of reports can be quite complex, and it's outside the scope of this course or a textbook. But it is good to understand what these reports are and why they're important, as you'll likely come across these in business or in more advanced courses in your studies. So we now know how data is collected and reported, but how is it used to improve decision making? Well, unfortunately, in many businesses and in many cases, it's not. A good example is scanner data collected by grocery stores when they scan each product going through the register. According to at least one grocery store chain, as reported by the California Management Review in 2001, only about 2% of scanner data is ever actually used in decision making. Some chains even throw all the data away after the transactions have been completed. We call failing to utilize data for decision making the data resource challenge. The problem is partly that companies fail to see the data as an asset, as they would money in the bank, manufacturing equipment, or real estate. Recall from our first lecture that information is your business's most important resource, and data is how we create that information. Failing to turn, to turn data into meaningful information is essentially leaving money on the table. So how do we treat data as an asset and ensure we use it for decision making? Well, that all begins with a focus on business intelligence. And that brings us to our next topic of business intelligence systems, or BI systems for short. So what are BI systems? They're systems for providing information for improving decision making, and they largely fall into five different categories. Here we see figure 8.6 from your textbook, which breaks down each BI system into its given category and describes the characteristics and competitive advantages of each type of system. Group Decision Support Systems, or GDSS, allow multiple people to collaborate to make a decision. As we discussed in a previous lecture, collaboration is critical for businesses as it allows us to make better decisions with less bias than we could do individually. GDSS systems allow this to be done remotely and even in some cases completely anonymously. Reporting systems integrate data from multiple sources, process it, and produce reports such as the OLAP report that we saw previously. Reports help improve decision making by providing relevant, accurate, and timely information to the right person at the right time. Recall that these are all qualities of good information, and a good report should have the same characteristics. Data mining systems use sophisticated statistical techniques to find patterns and relationships in data. They improve decision making by discovering patterns that we otherwise may have never noticed and help us predict future outcomes. 
We'll dive deeper into data mining systems later in this lecture. Knowledge management systems, or KM for short, connect and share human knowledge of products, best practices, and much more among employees, managers, and customers. This is very similar to the idea of content management systems, which manage content. Except knowledge management systems manage and preserve knowledge instead of pure content. They're important for preserving institutional knowledge that could be lost with employee turnover, for example. They also help foster innovation, improve customer service, and reduce costs by collecting and sharing human knowledge in a centralized location. Lastly, expert systems encapsulate the knowledge of human experts. These are different from knowledge management systems, which simply store and manage information, as expert systems can make decisions themselves. They do this by encoding human knowledge as if-then rules or flow charts that can make diagnoses or recommendations. They improve decision-making by allowing non-experts to get recommendations based on expert knowledge, based on their cir current circumstances. An example of a very simple expert system would be the COVID-19 screening process used by many organizations during the pandemic. On the screen right now is the CDC screening process for school children, determining whether they can go to school or not. Coding expert knowledge like this allows non-medical experts to make good decisions about sending their children to school based on a number of factors, including symptoms, test results, and risk. Many governments and organizations even created automated systems based on these rules, such as the Ontario COVID-19 self-assessment site, to make a recommendation about self-isolation based on current symptoms and vaccination status. These could be seen as simple expert systems, and they are becoming far more common in the medical field for assisting with diagnosing patients. So our next topic is data warehouses. Now don't let the name fool you here. These aren't physical buildings or facilities. Rather, they're a type of centralized repository of data that stores data pulled from multiple sources in an organization. They're a core component of business intelligence systems. But before we get too deeply into that, why do we need data warehouses? After all, we already talked about databases and they seem to do a fine job of storing data. Well, the problem comes in when we don't want to just store the data, but also perform analysis on it. Databases are great for processing everyday transactions, like storing and retrieving data, but they're not set up for in-depth data analysis. In general, it's not a great idea to do complex analysis on live production or operational databases. Allowing your data analysis to have direct, uncontrolled access to your operational database has some serious issues. First, they could accidentally edit or delete data that could be extremely damaging to your business. And second is that in some cases your database might contain sensitive or confidential information that you don't want just any employee to have access to. For example, it might contain things like salary information or in the medical industry, health records. Lastly, data analysis can be um, very resource intensive. Performing this analysis on your operational database could slow all of your operations down and that could bring everything, including manufacturing, to a crawl and impact your ability to run your business. The solution to this is to extract the relevant data into data warehouses for processing and analytical work so there'll be no impact on operations, and the data can be in a form most useful for business intelligence work. Data warehouses are facilities, again, not necessarily physical facilities, for managing the organization's BI data and performing a number of functions on it to make it readily available for processing. These functions include obtaining and combining the data from other information systems in the organization in a central location, cleaning the data to deal with all of those data problems we discussed at the beginning of this lecture, organizing and creating relationships in the data, and cataloging the data to make it easier for later retrieval. Data warehouses still use database management systems, or DBMS, but they tend to be specialized for this task rather than general purpose. As a database is still used, this means that we are storing metadata, or data about data, just as we discussed in our lecture on databases and read about in chapter five of your text. Remember, a big part of databases is that they store not only the data, but metadata as well. We see this data warehouse process in this figure from your textbook. First, data is extracted from existing information systems in your business such as your operations and purchasing systems. 
This can also include external data from suppliers, retailers, and other third parties outside your organization. Next, the data is cleansed and prepared for storage in the data warehouse. Issues like missing values, inconsistent formats, integration issues, and dirty data are hopefully resolved at this stage. The data is then finally stored in your data warehouse, which is essentially a specialized kind of database designed for business intelligence and data analytical work. Lastly, the data can be used in BI tools and systems for producing information for decision making. It's important to note here that this is not a one-time process, but a continuous one. We're constantly taking information from our information systems, cleaning it and extracting it, storing it in data warehouses, and then using it in BI tools to produce information and help us with decision making. Closely related topic to data warehouses is data marts. Data marts are data collections created to address the needs of a specific business function, problem, or opportunity. They are smaller than data warehouses and don't require the user of the mart to have data analysis experience, like that of a data warehouse. Organizations tend to have more than one data mart, normally one per function or problem they wish to provide information about. So the big difference between a data warehouse and a data mart is that marts have a specific purpose and tend to only store data required to fulfill that purpose. Whereas data warehouses tend to be centralized store of general data for a whole organization, without a specific purpose in mind. Bringing back that figure we saw previously of a data warehouse, we can now add in several data marks to get an idea of how they fit into things. In this example, we have a data mark for web sales, store sales, and inventory. Each gets its data from a central data warehouse, has its own set of BI tools and systems for processing the data into information for a specific purpose. For example, the inventory data mart might be processing data to find ideal inventory layouts for optimal item picking, while the web sales data mart may be evaluating our web page's design features. A key feature is that data marts can be used by non-expert users, like managers who need the information that they produce for decision making. Now, our last topic for the lecture is data mining. Data mining is a vast and complex subject, and it gets into a lot of statistical things and math that are far out of the scope of this course. So we'll be covering this at a very high level. It's still important to understand what data mining is, however, as we're starting to see a split in the field, we're starting to become a more divided between creators of data mining systems and users of those systems. So while you might not be creating those systems, you might definitely be a user of one of those systems. So we need to have some understanding of what data mining is. Good analogy for this is you don't need to understand how a microwave works to cook dinner in it, or to create a recipe that uses one. In the past, when a company wanted to do something involving AI, machine learning, or data mining, they would hire an expert in these areas. However, as the techniques become more common and the tools more available and easier to use, this is no longer necessary for common data, data science tasks. It would be like hiring a microwave engineer to write your recipes for cooking dinner in your microwave. Similarly, for data science fields, I think we're going to start seeing more data technician type programs where people are trained to use these systems, such as data mining tools, as opposed to creating them from scratch, like a data scientist might. Okay, that's great, but what is data mining? Well, data mining is the application of statistical techniques to find patterns and relationships among data with the goal of finding patterns, classifying data, or even predicting the future. It draws on a number of different fields, including mathematics, statistics, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. We commonly call this combination of fields data science, which is an, an interdisciplinary field that is starting to receive significant attention in both academia and industry. Western, for example, has recently started undergrad programs in data science. And as I mentioned, I think we're going to start seeing more applied programs for data science in the near future that are focusing more on using these tools as opposed to creating them. Data mining techniques can be categorized as unsupervised or supervised. Let's take a look at what I mean by that. In unsupervised data mining, analysts do not start with a clear idea of what they're looking for. They don't have pre-existing models or hypotheses that they're trying to confirm or disprove, but rather they're applying data mining techniques to the data to see what they can discover. Once they get the results, they try to formalize hypotheses to explain them, or basically explain the results they found, which can be later verified through further testing. An example of this type of data mining is cluster analysis. 
This technique tries to find groups with common characteristics and sets of data. For example, let's say we had some data here with two features, or data points. This could be the likelihood of a customer making a second purchase on the y-axis versus the length of time they've been a customer on the x-axis. Cluster analysis would try to group these data points based on where they fall with respect to these features. For example, we might find that a group of new customers um, tends to make a second purchase right away, shown here in green, and that we also have a group that tends to wait a bit longer, shown here in blue. Now you might be thinking this is all very straightforward. I could easily draw these circles and find these groups on my own, and you'd be right for this data set. But in real life, we're not just dealing with two features, that is two variables or dimensions. We could be dealing with thousands of dimensions, and the cluster would not be a simple 2D shape like a circle, but a hyperplane cutting through my multi-dimensional space that we couldn't even visualize or draw ourselves. So the key here is that we're gonna need a computer to do this. We can't just do it in our head. Second key point is that with unsupervised learning, we may have had no idea that these groups existed before we even ran this data mining analysis. And we would come up with a explanation or a hypothesis to explain these clusters afterwards. Perhaps in this case, the new customers are more likely to place an order right away, and we should focus our marketing efforts on them over old customers. Supervised data mining takes the opposite approach. A model or hypothesis is formulated before the analysis is actually performed. Tests are then done with statistical techniques to estimate the parameters of the model. For example, perhaps we believe that the longer a potential customer views our ad on YouTube, the more likely they are to purchase our product. We could use supervised data mining techniques, such as regression analysis, to test this hypothesis. Regression analysis attempts to measure the impact of a set of variables on another variable, or to put it more simply, tries to find a correlation between these two variables. Let's say in this graph, the y-axis is the likelihood of a potential customer buying our product, and the x-axis is the time spent watching our YouTube ad. Linear regression analysis would try to fit a line to this data and give us an equation that would tell us the likelihood of a potential customer purchasing our product based on the time spent watching our ad. So for example, perhaps that line would look like this, and it would give us an equation that describes that line. Another example of supervised data mining techniques is market-based analysis. This tries to determine the sales patterns based on items that tend to be purchased together. For example, if you purchase some 3D printer filament from Amazon for printing ducks, you might notice that you start getting other recommendations related to these items. What's happening here is that Amazon is comparing your purchases and what items you've viewed to that of other customers and showing you products that other customers have purchased after buying or viewing the same items as you. Netflix and other streaming services do similar types of analysis to recommend you movies based on movies you've watched and what other people who've watched the same movies have enjoyed. This type of analysis can be extremely powerful and useful as it allows for very targeted advertising, enabling you to spend your marketing and sales resources on potential customers that are most likely to actually purchase your products and services. And with that, we have reached the end of our discussion on decision-making and business intelligence. There's one key takeaway here, it's that to make good decisions, we need good information. Computer information systems, such as business intelligence systems, can help us create and process this information. It has to be done carefully and with clear business goals and objectives in mind, or we can quickly fall into pitfalls such as information overload. That's all I have for you in this video. Thank you for watching, and have a great day.